Letters from Rifka, Part 1. The author's note. When I begin this book, I set out to write about my family's migration from Russia to the United States. I recalled a story about my grandmother wearing white kid gloves as she rode through Poland in the back of an ox cart. I remember the tale of my grandfather. He was denied passage onto the Titanic because he was, quote, only an immigrant. But that's all I remember. I phoned my mother and my aunts for help. They contributed a wealth of stories about their own childhood, but they couldn't shed much light on, fa on the family history. Call your great Aunt Lucy, my mother suggested. I barely remembered Aunt Lucy. I pictured a frail 80-year-old woman. To my surprise, the voice on the other end of the line resound resounded with strength steadness and humor. Well, certainly I can help you, she said. What do you want to know? I sent Aunt Lucy a list of questions in the mail. She shot me back a tape on which she spoke at breakneck speed for five breathless minutes. I remember holding onto the handles of the tape player, feeling like I was a passenger on the roller coaster as I listened to Aunt Lucy's accounts of her journey to America. When she signed off, the hiss and crackle of blank tape taunted me. I phoned Aunt Lucy again. I've listened to your tape, I said, and I think I need to see you. She laughed as if she'd known I was coming all along. Two months later, on a steamy East Coast afternoon, with my head full of research, I arrived on Aunt Lucy's doorstep. Greeting me was a tiny woman with an unruly bun of snow white hair on the top of her head. She welcomed me into her home and into her past. Letters from Rifka draws largely on the memories of Lucy Everton. I have changed names and adjusted certain details, but this story is above all else Aunt Lucy's story. Letters from Rifka. And from the gloomy land of lonely exile to a new country bade me come. Pushkin. September 2nd, 1919, in Russia. My dear cousin Tuva, we made it. If it had not been for your father, though, I think my family would all be dead now. Mama, Papa, Nathan, Saul, and me. At the very best, we would be in that filthy prison in Burdiction, not rolling through. Ukraine on a freight train bound for Poland. I am sure you and cousin Hannah were glad to see Uncle Avram come home today. How worried his daughters must have been after the locked doors and the whispering of last night. Soon, Babe Ruth, my little dear grandmother, will hear of our escape. I hope she gives a big pot of Frulich's cream to Uncle Avram. How better could she thank him? When the sun rose above the trees at the train station in Burdikov this morning, I stood alone outside a boxcar, my heart knocking against my ribs. I stood there trying to look older than my 12 years. I was wrapped in a new shawl that Cousin Hannah gave to me. Still, I trembled. Wear this in hell, Hannah had whispered in my ear as she draped the shawl over my shoulders early this morning before we slipped from your house into the dark. Come, Papa had said, leading us through the woods to the train station. I looked back to the flickering lights of your house, Tuva. Quickly, Rifka, Papa whispered. The boys and Mama and I must hide before light. You can distract the guards, can't you, little sister? Nathan had said, putting an arm around me. In the darkness, I could not see his eyes, but I felt them studying me. Yes, I answered, not wanting to disappoint him. At the train station, Papa, Mama, Papa and Mama hid behind bales of hay in the boxcars that were to my right. My two giant brothers, Nathan and Saul, crouched in separate cars to my left. Papa said that we should hide in different cars. If the guards discovered only one of us, perhaps the others might still be able to escape. Behind me in the dusty corner of a boxcar sat my own rucksack. It waited for me. 
holding what little I owned in this world. I had packed Mama's candlesticks, and they were wrapped in my two heavy dresses at the bottom of the sack. Your gift to me, the book of Pushkin, I did not pack. I kept it out, holding it in my hands. I would have liked to fly away, to race back up the road, stopping at every door to say goodbye, to say that we were going to America. But I could not. Papa said we must tell no one that we were leaving. Not even Bobe Ruth. Only you and Hannah and Uncle Avram knew. I am so glad at least you knew, Tuva. As Papa expected, not long after he and Mama and the boys had hidden themselves, two guards emerged from a wooden shelter. They thundered down the platform in their heavy boots, climbing in and out of the cars, making their search. They did not notice me at first. Saul says I am too little for anyone to notice, but you know Saul. He never has a nice word to say to me, and I am small for a girl of 12. Still, my size did not keep the guards from noticing me. I think the guards missed seeing me at first because they were so busy in search of the train. They were searching for Nathan. You know as well as I, Tuva, that when, I, when a Jewish boy deserts the Russian army, the army tries to find him. They bring him back and kill him in front of his regiment as a warning to the others. Those who have helped him, they also die. Late last night when Nathan slipped away from his regiment and appeared at our door, joy filled my heart at seeing my favorite brother again. Yet a troubled look worried Nathan's face. He hugged me only for a moment. His dimpled smile vanished as quickly as it come, came. I've come, he said, to warn Saul. The soldiers will soon follow. They will take him into the army. I am ashamed, Tuva, to admit that at first hearing Nathan's news made me glad. I wanted Saul gone. He drives me crazy. From his big ears to his big feet, I cannot stand the sight of him. Good riddance, I thought. How foolish I was not to understand what Nathan's news really meant to our family. You should not have come. Mama said to Nathan, they will shoot you when you return. Papa said, Nathan isn't going to return. Hurry, we must pack. And we all stared at him. Quickly, Papa said, clapping his hands. Rifka, run and fill your rucksack with all of your belongings. I do not know what Papa thought I owned. Mama said, Rifka, do you have room in your bag for my candlesticks? The candlesticks, Mama? I ask. We either take them, Rifka, or we leave them to the greedy peasants. Soon enough they will swoop down like vultures to pick our house bare, Mama said. Papa said, Your brothers in America have sent for us, Rifka. It is time to leave Russia, and we are not coming back ever. Don't we need papers, I ask? Papa looked from Nathan to Saul. There is no time for papers he said, and then I begin to understand. We huddled in your cellar. Remember, she's writing to her cousin Tuva. We huddled in your cellar through the black night planning our escape. Uncle Avram only shut you out to protect you, Tuva. Hearing the guard speak this morning, I understood his precaution. It was dangerous enough for you to know we were leaving. We could not risk telling you the details of our escape in case the soldiers came to question you. The guards were talking about Nathan. They were saying what they would do to him once they found him and what they would do to anyone else who had helped him. Nathan hid under a stack of burlap bags, one boxcar away from me. I knew no matter how frightened I was, I must not let them find Nathan. The guards said terrible things about our family. They did not know me or Mama or Papa. They did not really even know Nathan. They could never have said those things about my brother. They could never have said those things about my brother Nathan if they knew him. Saul, maybe. Clumsy-footed Saul. They could have said hateful things about Saul, but never Nathan. The guards spoke ill of us, not because of anything we had done, not because of anything we had said, but just because we were Jews. Why is it 
Tuva, that in Russia, no matter what the trouble, the blame always falls upon the Jews. The guards' bayonets plunged into the bales and bags and crates in each boxcar. That is how they searched, with the brutal blades of their bayonets. The sound of steel in wood echoed through the morning. I stood trembling in the dawn. Tuva, gripping your book in my hands to steady myself. I feared the guards would guess from one look at me what I was hiding. For just a moment, I glanced towards the cars where Mama and Papa hid to gather courage from them. My movement must have caught the guards' attention. You! I heard a shout. You there! The guards hastened down the track towards me. One had a rough, unshaven face and a broad mouth. He stared at me for a moment or two as if he recognized me. Then he seemed to change his mind. He reached out to touch my hair. That is what Papa hoped for, I think. People have often stopped in wonder at my blonde curls. You say a girl must not depend on her looks, Tuva? It is better to be clever. But as the guards inspected me, from the worn toes of my boots to my hair spilling out from under my kerchief, I hoped my looks would be enough. I hated the guard touching my hair. I clutched your book of poetry tighter to keep my hands from striking him away. I knew I must not get angry with him. If I angered him, I not only put my life in danger, but I endangered Mama, Papa, and Nathan, and Saul, too. The guard with the unshaven face held my curls in his hand. He looked up and down the length of me as if he were hungry and I was a piece of mama's pastry. I held still. Inside I twisted like a wrung rag put on the outside, but on the outside I held still. Papa is so brave, the guards would not frighten him. I remember the times when soldiers came to our house and saw Papa feet a brand new pair of boots. Uncle Shalomo had made them for Papa from leftover pieces of leather. And the soldiers said, take the boots off, give them here. Papa refused. The soldiers whipped Papa, but still Papa refused to hand over his boots. They would have killed Papa for those boots. But their battalion marched into sight. The soldiers hit Papa once more, hard, so that he spit blood but they left our house empty-handed. This was the courage of my papa, but how could he ever think I had such courage? Courage or not, all of all my family, only I could stand before the Russian soldiers because of my blonde hair and my blue eyes. Papa and mama and the boys, they all have dark coloring and features of the Jews. Only I can pass for a Russian peasant. And of course, as you know, Tuva, of all my family, only I can speak Russian without a Yiddish accent. Uncle Avron calls it my gift for language. What kind of gift is this, Tuva? The guard ran his greasy fingers through my curls. He smelled of herring and onion. Why aren't you on your way to school? He demanded. My heart beat in my throat where my voice should have been. Mama is always saying, my mouth is as big as the village well. Even you, Tuvo, Tuva, no. Tell me that I, should, that I should not speak unless I have something to say. I know, I talk too much. Yet as the guard played with my hair, fear silenced me. Who are you? He asked. What are you doing here? I forced myself to answer. I spoke in Russian, making my accent just like Katya's, the peasant girl, who comes to light our Sabbath fire. I am here, I said, to take the train. My mother has found me work in a wealthy house. You are young to leave home, the rough-faced guard said, brushing the end of my hair across his palm. And such a pretty little thing. That's just what my mother told me, I said, but she insisted that I go anyway. The guard laughed. <laughs> Maybe you should stay in Burdikva, 
I might have better work for you here. Maybe I will, I said, looking into his rough, ugly face. Papa did not tell me what to say to the guards. He simply said to distract them. If it had been just one guard, I might have occupied him until the train left the station. Only there was another guard. He had a thin face and a straight back. His eyes were like the tertevic in the spring when the snow melts, churning with green ice. My curls did not interest him. Let her go, the thin guard ordered. Search the box cars around and behind her. My heart banged in my throat. I had to keep the guards away from my family until Uncle Avram arrived from the factory. I prayed for Uncle Avram to come soon. Tuva, I tried to do what you always are telling me. I tried to be clever. You are in the army, aren't you? I said. I know all about soldiers in the army. The guy, guard with the eyes of green ice, stared hard at me. Tell me what you know, he demanded. Well, I said, when I was nine, I saw some soldiers from Germany. Did you ever see those German soldiers? Both of the guards looked as if they remembered the Germans well. Those Germans came in airplanes, I said. So noisy, those planes. And I clasped my hands over my ears, banging myself with your book of Pushkin. The stiff-backed guard glared at me. There was a German pilot, I said. A German pilot with a big pot belly. I wondered how he could fit in the plane, such a small plane, and such a big German. The thin guard pivoted away from me. He squinted at something moving in the bushes across the train yard. Lifting his rifle, he aimed at the bushes and he fired. Two birds rose noisily into the air. I started talking faster. That German liked me pretty well, I said. He bought me candy and he took me for walks. One day he put me in a plane and started the propeller. I didn't like that, so I jumped out. I knew I was talking too fast. When I talked like this at home, Saul always got annoyed with me. I couldn't make myself slow down. The words came spilling out. If I could just keep them listening, they would run out of time to search the train. I jumped out of that fat German's plane and I landed in the mud. I said, and I ran home like the devil was chasing me. The German called for me to stop, but I wasn't stopping for him. I, enough, the thin guard commanded. Enough of your chatter. He pushed me aside and he climbed into the freight car behind me. He sank his bayonet into the hay bales inside the car. I asked the guard with the rough beard, what is the problem? What is it you're looking for? I tried to keep my voice from betraying my fear. Suddenly, the guard reappeared in the doorway to the freight car with my rucksack dangling from his bayonet. What is this? I thought, if he finds Mama's candlesticks in that rucksack, it's all over for my entire family. Why well, can't go without my belongings, can I? I said. The two guards stared, started arguing. Leave the girl alone said the one with the rough beard. She's a peasant, farmed out by her mother. The other narrowed his eyes. She's hiding something, he said. What could she hide? The thin guard glared at me again. This is very heavy for clothing, he said, swinging my rucksack at the end of his bayonet. What have you got in here? What do you think? said the guard with the rough face. You think she's hiding a Jew in a rucksack? You think she has something to do with the Nebrot boy? Look at her, listen to her, she's no Jew. The other guard jumped down from the car, tossing my rucksack on the ground. My bag hit with a thud. What's in there? He asked again, preparing to rip my bag open with the razor sharp blade of his bayonet. Books, I said, like this one. And I held up your pushkin, Tuva. I like to read. The guard hesitated, staring into my face, but he did not rip open my rucksack. He started instead towards the next car, the car with Nathan inside, 
I did not know how to stop him. That is when your father arrived, Tuva. It hadn't taken him long at the it had taken him longer at the factory than he'd expected. Guards, come here! Uncle Avram shouted from the woods. The guards turned towards his voice. I turned too. The trees on either side of the road dwarfed Uncle Avram. He stood short and round with his red beard brushing the front of his coat. I knew the smell of that coat. He and Papa and Mama had planned for this. Mama had hoped not to involve your father, but Uncle Avram insisted on being part of the plan. He would make certain the guards suspected nothing. He said Papa could not let the fate of our entire family rest on the shoulders of a child. I did not like when he talked about me that way last night, calling me a child. I felt insulted. Yet when I heard him call out to the guards this morning, all I felt was relief. Guards, Uncle Avram shouted again. My factory, someone's broke into my factory. He is a good actor, your father, in case you didn't know. The guards squinted their eyes against the morning sun. They recognized Uncle Avram, but the thin guard did not want to help him. We must inspect this entire train before it leaves the station, he said to the guard beside him. That man is only a Jew. Why bother with the troubles of a Jew? The guard with the unshaven face hesitated. We might get in trouble if we don't help him. That's Avran Abrosman. I once carried a message to him at his factory. He has important friends. Come, Uncle Avram demanded. Hurry, I haven't got all day. I thought they would shoot Uncle Avram for speaking to them in that way. They certainly would have shot Papa, but Uncle Avram's demands seemed to make up their mind to go with him. I knew your family had influence, Tuva, but I never realized how much. The guards left me by the train and I headed across the clearing towards your father and his factory. They, the guards left me by the train and they headed across the clearing. I prayed that Uncle Avram had made the robbery look real so that they would not suspect him. The train whistle blew once, twice, as the rough bearded guard and Uncle Avram disappeared up the road. The thin guard turned back towards me, looking for a moment as if he might change his mind and return to finish the inspection. Then he too vanished into the woods. The train straining on the tracks moved a little backwards before it started rolling forwards, slowly out of Burdix of, I've got to look that word up, Burdix of. You know what a good runner I am. I have learned to run to keep out of Saul's reach. Outrunning the train was easy. I heaved my rucksack from the ground tossing it into the boxcar. Stones skipped out from under my boots as I scrambled alongside, jumped on board, and sprawling out on my belly, pulled myself in. Quickly, I tucked into the shadow of the car so no one could see me. The freight car smelled warm and rich like cattle, and I thought of Boubé Ruth's sweet cow, Frusula? I write this letter to you with my good school pencil in the blank pages at the front of your pushkin. I am writing very neat and tiny so as not to spoil the book. I hope you do not mind that I am writing in your book, Tuva, but I have no other paper. I know this letter can never reach you, but in writing to you, I feel less frightened. You have been a big sister and a best friend to me. I cannot bear to think of never talking to you again. So I will talk to you by writing about my journey. We are headed for the Polish border. That is all I know. I cannot even speak the language. What will it be like in Poland? And beyond that, in America, where at last I will meet my three oldest brothers. I can hardly believe that I too will soon live in such a place as America. Shalom, my little house. Shalom, my family. Shalom, Berdikas, and my dear little grandmother, Bube Ruth. Shalom, Hannah and Aunt Anna and Uncle Avram. But most of all, Tuva.
Shalom to you, Rivka. Next chapter, next part. And with a sword, he clove to my breast, plucked out the heart he made beat higher, and in my stricken bosom pressed instead a coal of living fire. Pushkin. September 3rd, 1919, in Poland. Dear Tava, we were very fortunate that we ran into no further trouble until we reached the Polish border. At the border, though, guards came aboard. Get off the train, a squat man ordered. His round face and red cheeks did not match the sharpness of his voice. Get all your things off the train. Take off your clothes. A doctor must examine you before you enter Poland. Can you imagine taking off your clothes just like that in the middle of a train yard? Tuva, doctors examine you often because of your crooked back. Is this the way they would treat you? Well, I fought them. I would not take off my clothes for them. Do as I say, the guard barked at me, or you will be set back, all of you. From the fierceness of his voice, I knew he would not hesitate to turn us over to the Russian police. I could not have my family return to Burdictions because of me. I took off my clothes. I huddled beside my mama as we stood in our underwear in the waning daylight outside the boxcar. Aunt Rachel had made this underwear for me. It was white cotton and very pretty. She had made me two sets, but one was stolen from me as I swam in the teeter of this past summer. I thought of the things the Russians had taken from my family as I stood in the train yard and I was angry. Why, Tuva? Why is it that if a Russian peasant does not get what he wants, he feels justified in stealing it from a Jew? Papa and the boys undressed on the opposite side of the car. At least they allowed us that much privacy. Mama and I, we had folded our clothes on top of our bag in the dry grass along the track. The guards picked up our clothes and our belongings and took them away. Even my rucksack with Mama's candlesticks. Before I could yell to them to bring our things back, the doctor came. He growled at us. I could not understand his words but he made it clear what he wanted. He ordered us to remove our underwear. This doctor, he stank of vomit and snops. His breath choked my throat and I thought I would be sick. Mama didn't seem to notice his stench. She smiled and nodded to him. Perhaps she feared that we would be sent back to Russia. Why else would she act so? Mama helped me to remove my underwear shielding my body with her own. Her gold locket hung between her breasts. Keep quiet for once, Rifka, she whispered in my ear, and stay behind me. I covered my nakedness with my hands as best as I could. But Mama, she acted as stripping before the Polish doctor was no trouble, like we did this every day. She pretended this, I think, to protect me. The doctor examined us. He took longer with Mama. I could hardly believe this brave woman was the same who wept with fear in the cellar last night. The doctor spent so much time with Mama, he hardly noticed me. When he did turn his attention to me, the way he looked gave me goose flesh. Tu Tuva, you are so practical. You will say I had goose flesh because we stood naked outside in the cold. But it was not the cold that caused me to shiver. That doctor made me feel dirty. He looked in my eyes and my mouth and my hair. Are you sick? He asked me in Russian. I kept my eyes down. I could not stand to look at him. I stared instead at my toes that were curled tight in the stones at the edge of the tracks. I prayed the doctor would just go away. He yelled at me something in Polish. Mama spoke with him. Then. She took my hand and led me into a small building. In the building, a woman sprayed us with something vile. It burned my skin and my scalp, my nose and my eyes. Finally, the Polish guards allowed us back onto the train. They returned our clothes to us and our bags, stinking of fumigation. My eyes watered from the stench of it. That was not the worst though. When I lifted my rucksack, it was not as heavy as it had been before. I searched the entire bag. I emptied it on the floor of the train, but Mama's candlesticks were gone. 
So they stole our candlesticks, Mama said. It could be worse, Rivka, much worse. Stop sniffling and finish getting dressed. We pulled our clothes back on before Papa and Nathan and Saul joined us. Mama sighed with relief as she climbed into the car. I turned away from their nakedness. How could the Poles do this to my Papa and my brother? How could the Poles do this to me? The train started moving before Papa and the boys finished dressing. That is how we entered Poland. I have never been in another country before, not even in another village. You know how the Russians kept us, Tuva, like prisoners, never permitting us to travel. Russia has not been so bad for you. With money, Russia could be very good, even for a Jew. For us, it was a prison. Poland does not look, look that different from predictive. The same crooked cottages, the same patchy roads, the same bony fences, leaning into the dust. Looking out from the train, we see people dressed like us, in browns and blacks, people wrapped in layers of clothes. The women bundle their heads in handkerchiefs. The men shuffle along in ankle coats and boots. Will it be like this in America too? I will stop writing for now. My heart throbs and my body aches from all that has happened. Shalom, my cousin, Rifka.